D12. I didn't record the part going over the syllabus. Um, so most of you said you have read these before. How many of you started reading these when you were like 9 or 10 or something like that? Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much been, been the case for most of my um, students. How many of you know the story of how they began? Anybody? What is it? Okay, a little bit. I heard, I don't know if it's true or false. I didn't really do too much research into it. But I heard there was a point where she had um, written, like, the first part of the book, and she really didn't even like it herself. And she, I think, like, tossed it to the side, and somebody found it. Um, no, no, I think that's some kind of urban legend or internet okay. legend. <laughs> um, Sounds cool. Rowling was a double major at Exeter University. She majored in, if I remember right, classics and French. Okay, um, So she's not a slacker. She couldn't get into Oxford. She wasn't accept accepted in Oxford. But they wish differently now. Um, but she was a double major. And so she learned Romance languages as part of her classics in, in French. And when she was fairly young, she went to teach English in um, Portugal, okay? While in Portugal, she met a Portuguese journalist who apparently was very handsome. Think Antonio Banderas when he was young. I mean, just a real hot guy. And whirlwind romance, um, engaged, married, pregnant, like within six months in that order, okay? And then he dumps her before even they'd been married a year. Before her child, her first child, Jessica, was born. Okay? Um, so she leaves Portugal and goes back to the UK. She doesn't go back to where she grew up. She grew up in the west of England um, near Gloucester, in the, the area called Gloucestershire. But instead she moves to Scotland, okay? moves to Edinburgh, where she's now a public assistant. She is an unwed single mother. Okay? You could think of all the, you know, stereotypes that attach to that. And she is on public assistance. Nice word for welfare, okay? For some reason, and I don't remember what the reason is, she is going down to London, and she's on a train from Manchester to London, okay? That train pulls into St. Pancras Station. In, in London, take my Harry Potter course in London, even though you're taking the Harry Potter now, take it in London because then you get to do stuff in London. Um, and I've had students do that before. Um, St. Pancras Station is like right here. King's Cross is literally across the street. I mean, literally. There are two major train stations across the street from each other. But this one goes northwest. This one goes along the east and northeast. Okay? They don't go to the same locations. So she was on this train from Manchester to St. Pancras Station in London. In one moment, she's just a single unwed mother on welfare, and the next moment, she's a single unwed mother on welfare with the idea of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that he is a wizard and his parents were murdered by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived. I mean, literally. She's traveling on along. She's in her seat. One moment, she has no ideas whatsoever about that. She's been writing stories since she was a kid. Okay? But they're all horrible. Nobody wants to read any of them. Her sister, maybe. Um, but the next moment, she has this idea. Okay? This is in around 1991, I believe. So she starts writing this story. That story, this one, gets published in 1997. Within 10 years, and when it gets published in 1997, she's still unwed, <laughs> okay, and single, well, single, um, and on welfare, okay? 
penniless, essentially. But within 10 years, she's worth a billion. Within 10 years, she has more wealth than the Queen of England. She is wealthier than the Queen of England. She's the wealthiest woman in the United Kingdom. She's one of the wealthiest women in the world. Why? Because she took her train ride and had an idea? Why didn't you take that train ride? Why didn't, more importantly, I take that train ride? You know, where does that kind of literary inspiration come from? Because nobody knows. Nobody knows how that idea popped into her mind. One moment she doesn't have it, the next moment she does, and 15 years later she's a billionaire. Okay? So, she gets that idea and she starts to write this story. As I said, she's living in Edinburgh and places and names and things from Edinburgh start to find their way into this. But she's not only writing this, she's also taking notes for six other parts to this story. She knows from the outset it won't be just one book, it'll be seven books. Why? Because she has told us in interviews, one of her favorite authors wrote a series of books for children that had seven books in it. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia. Okay. She has said, she's kind of shied away from this over the last several years. She said early in the 2000s, you know, that it, if she went into a room that had a copy of the Chronicles of Narnia, she physically could not stop herself from walking over and picking up one of the books and starting to read. She, she, just, she just had to kind of start reading. Okay. What else? So she starts writing it. She writes it all in longhand. She writes it on yellow legal pads. There are two primary locations in Edinburgh that she goes to to write it. Both of them cafes. You know, jiggling her daughter in her bassinet as she's writing. Okay. And as she's working on the first volume, she gets a big chunk of it done, and she applies for a Scottish Humanities grant, and they give her some. I think it's like 1,500 pounds, okay? Which is enough to help her get by and such. But when she finishes it, she sends it off to a publisher. She gets a rejection letter. Sends it off to another one, gets another rejection letter. And depending upon the source you find, and I've not yet found an actual direct quotation from her. I'm sure there's one available. Um, depending upon the source you know, you find, she is rejected anywhere from 12 to 20 times. Before, Bloomsbury UK publisher says, all right, we'll take a chance. And they print, if I remember correctly, the first volume has an initial print run of 1,500 copies. Now, 1,500 is a really, really small print run for a major publisher like Bloomsbury. They're essentially saying, we're going to cover the cost of the paper <laughs> by this. Okay? And it gets put in various book, um, bookstores in London and stuff, and people start buying it. There's no advertising. None. All advertising is word of mouth. Somebody buys it for his or her daughter or son. That kid reads it, loves it, lets his or her friend borrow it. That kid's parents then ask, uh, that kid then asks his or her parents, will you buy this for me? They do. That kid then lends it to his or her friend. And it starts circulating like that. And that's how it gets bought. And it sells out pretty quickly. So they do another print run, I think 5,000 copies. That sells out fairly quickly, okay? So she finishes the next one. Bloomsbury publishes it, larger initial print run, okay? And it starts selling, it starts getting at least mentioned in the Bloomsbury catalog, but it's not getting radio, TV, bus, tube advertising like the later editions get. It's beginning with the third one that you start to hear about it in the United States. Okay? I first heard about it, I think it was in January of 1998. I was at, at Sam's Club buying groceries. Excuse me. I was on my way to work one morning. 
back when I still listened to NPR. And the London bureau chief of NPR talked about this new series of books, and he compared it to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, but he compared it by ragging on Lewis, saying, you know, it's not like that stodgy old Christian allegory, you know, Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And I mentally just kind of turned him off. Well, I'm not even going to look at this if he's going to talk about Lewis that way, because I, I teach a course on Lewis. You know, one of the reasons I'm an English professor is because of the English influence of Lewis and Tolkien and such. Okay? So I mentally put a block. About two months later, that's in January of 98, about two months later, I'm at Sam's Club, and I'm leaving, and they've got their big book display, and I see this one, the second one, and the third one, now out in hardback, okay, brand new. And I'm like, that's that book, those books T.R. Reed was talking about. And I pick up the first one, and I start reading it, and I'm not kidding, first page, first paragraph, I'm like, okay, this is not what I expected. Just the Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. That thank you very much. That little British quality to it. And I'm like, hmm. And I read the first chapter. I'm standing there. I've got all my groceries. And I read the first chapter. <laughs> and I'm like, <clears throat> and I throw it in the throw it in the basket, in the cart. I check out. I read it like the next day. I go back the next day and I buy the next two books. And I think I taught uh, the first course where I included the books was the next semester. I mean, it was that, that fast. Okay. It's beginning the fourth book. It's with the fourth book that we begin to see what happening in the United States. Fourth book comes out summer of 2000. Release, Release parties. Release parties, what else? Internet sales. Okay. Amazon comes into existence in 1994. In 2000, Amazon and Barnes & Noble, because Barnes & Noble has a very new presence. It's not as, as extensive as Amazon's in, in the year 2000. In 2000, before you could physically put your hands on a book, something like... I don't remember the exact number, but it's well over a million have already been sold. And there's huge media, you know, uproar about how, how can the books be sold and people not have them in their hands? And what Amazon promises for that first re big release is they will be delivered to you the day they are sold in the bookstores. That is, you can go to the bookstore at midnight on whatever the day was, but if you don't go to the book bookstore at midnight, you will have your copy in your hand sometime during the next day. Okay, and a lot of people did both. They went to the midnight release party, bought a copy, and then they had already pre-ordered one um, for the very same reason, just to have it. Or if they have multiple readers in their family, like I did at that point, because my wife and I were reading them. My two eldest kids, who were. Uh, Eight and, no, seven and, what year was that, 2000? Uh, six and five, six and seven and five, something like that, at the time, were already reading them, okay, and had already read the first. They just, you know, had to have their own copies, essentially. Um, so you started to see the internet parties, you started to see the release parties, you started to see the massive advertising, such that when the seventh book came out in July of 2007, July 31st, 2007, um, well, let me back up. When that book came out in July of 2000, the top four books on the New York Times bestseller list of books were one, two, three, four. Harry Potter, one through four. Okay. When the fifth book came out, they were no longer one, two, three, four, and five on the New York Times bestseller list of books because the New York Times came out with a 
new way of doing their listing. Because they didn't think, quote unquote, kitty lit should be the top five books. Why? Because this wasn't serious literature to the New York Times. So they came out with a list of bestsellers, children's literature. And when book five came out, they were one through five. When book six came out, they were one through six. When book seven came out, they were one through seven. And a lot of people said, not really fair, New York Times, for, you know, changing the playing field. Because if they hadn't done that in 2007, these probably would have been one through seven on the New York Times bestseller list of books. But because they did, they did not include them. Instead, there's a bunch of crap like there usually is, okay? So what, what else happened? Well, she went from being penniless, as I said, to being a billionaire, but she also went from never having sold anything she had written to, in about 2012, I think, having sold over 450 million copies of these books. Now, that's all seven. So if you want, you know, 450 million divided by seven, roughly 60 million each. Okay. It took Tolkien over 50 years to sell over 250 million of the Lord of the Rings. That's one volume. That's counting Fellowship of the Ring, not as a separate individual book, but as part of the three volume Lord of the Rings. Okay. She did it in 10 years. Yeah, take that back. 15 years, okay, went to 450 million, such that it's become, other than the Bible, the fastest and best selling book in history, or series of books in history. She is credited, okay, with reviving reading for children. It's after her that R.L. Stein's Goosebumps books, you know, take off. It's after her. That uh, um, the tree, Magic Treehouse books take off. It's after her that, you know, Series of Unfortunate Events and all these other series, none of those predate this one. Right? None of them. So she kind of creates an audience. And not just an audience of The demographic that usually was thought of as being readers, girls. Boys were reading this too, okay? In fact, it's because of her American editor. I think this is right. 90% certain. I might be wrong about this, if memory serves. It's because of her American editor that she goes by JK and not Joanne. Because boys aren't going to read books by a girl. But J.R.R. R. Tolkien, because boys loved Tolkien, you know, wars and dragons and swords and all the sorcery and stuff. So, Jake, what, anybody know what the K stands for? Some people say it's Kathleen. She didn't have a middle initial. It was Joanne Rowling. The K gets added kind of for symmetry. Okay. What else? First book. What's its English title? Sorcerers. Philosopher's Stone. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The American title is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Why? Why the difference? Sorcerers are cooler than philosophers. Okay, sorcerers are cooler than philosophers, possibly. The American editor, Arthur E. Levine, okay, said... American adults will never buy a book for their children that has the word philosopher in the title. Because he implied American parents and their children are stupid. Because they don't like philosophy. They don't understand philosophy. Even though the philosopher's stone has nothing to do with philosophy. But you put sorcerers in and they will understand that. There's a problem with that, however. Well, there's a couple of problems, one of which is Arthur Levine, an idiot. The other problem is, there is no such thing in the history of ideas 
or the history of Western or even Eastern culture as a sorcerer's stone. There is such a thing in the history of Western ideas and Western culture as a philosopher's stone. In fact, it's not just Western. You see it in China, you see it in Egypt. People have been searching for, trying to create the philosopher's stone for as far back as 1000 BC. Why? Because of the properties that it had and the abilities it would give you. It's the basis behind the old alchemical tradition. This idea that on its base level, by base level I mean its very surface level, the stuff you easily see, okay? What was alchemy's goal? Twofold. It was, one, to turn, I don't know, even know if I have any here, base metal into gold. Why? Because then you could take a base metal, like the basest of base metal, lead, and turn it into gold. Why is lead not worth anything and gold is worth a lot? Gold is, rare. gold is rare, lead is common. Okay? And to create the elixir of life. To create what Ponce de Leon searched throughout Florida and the Gulf Coast for the fountain of immortality. Okay? That was the base level understanding of what alchemy was all about. The alchemists were really about much, much more than that. Both of those imply what? Transformation. Changing something to something else. Changing this to something else. And through this, changing this to something else. Changing the mortal into immortal. Okay? Fleeing from death. Voldemort. That's what the name means. Voldemort means to fly or flee from death. Okay? So that the alchemists of the Middle Ages in the ancient world, they were seeking purification. Purification of this. Okay, that's the transformation. Base to something purer, something higher. And what came along as a result of that? Immortality. Most of them were Christian in the Middle Ages. Because it ties in so very easily with Christian ideology. Okay? St. Paul talks about transforming the mind. Okay? Putting on Christ, who is immortal, obviously. Okay? There, it's through doctrine and belief and such... The alchemists thought, maybe we can actually make something that makes it happen more easily. Okay? So you take an idea from culture, the Philosopher's Stone, and you substitute it with this. What in the world is a Sorcerer's Stone? Well, it's essentially the same object, but we're going to rename it. Why? Because we don't like philosophy, because we're too stupid. But what happened as a result of changing the name? No. Okay. What else? How many of you had parents or had friends with parents who wouldn't let their child read these books? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. I mean, you got the word sorcery right there in the title. In the Torah... First five books of the Old Testament say what? Don't hang with witches, man. <laughs> Don't have anything to do with them. You got a witch in your midst? Stone her or him, because witches aren't just female. Okay? Don't have anything to do with it. I was teaching a graduate course, Old English in Beowulf, and I had a student whose name escaped me. But her husband was a minister, okay? and she had, I don't remember, a few kids. 
And I went off some rant one day about the Harry Potter novels. Um, probably talked about medieval symbolism. And she came to me afterwards, came to my office, and said, Dr. Sherman, I just can't believe you teach those books. I can't believe you like a good Christian man like Sherman. I can't believe blah, blah. And I was like, whatever her name was, I said, you know, I not only like them, I not only teach them, I encourage people to read them because of the ideas and the values that the books inculcate, especially in children. I said, you know, you should always read a book before you burn it. You should know what it says before you say it's bad for you. Okay? And I gave her some examples of, of some of the ideas that are in the books. I said, now, if your understanding of the books comes from the films, you're going to get something different. Why? Because the story arc from the films is very different from the story arc of the books. How can I say that? Because the seventh film and the eighth film each leave out something extremely important in the seventh book. The first part of the seventh film omits something from the beginning of the seventh book. And the last part of the eighth film leaves out something extremely important from the end of the seventh book. Okay? And they completely change the meaning of the books. I mean completely. From black to white. All right? That you wouldn't understand if you read the books but hadn't seen the films. If all you'd seen was the films, you'd walk away going, yeah, here, he got, man, he, he gave Voldemort what for. Voldemort got what was coming to him. When you read the books and you see Harry offer Voldemort what at the end of the seventh book? Anybody know? It's in the, it's in the big, you know, climactic battle scene, which doesn't occur in the book. Close. Close, he offers him redemption. He offers him the opportunity to make himself whole, to put himself back together again. All the talk about Horcruxes, we find out in the seventh book, well, how can you undo Horcruxes? Hermione points this out. What do you have to feel? Remorse. Contrition. And Harry tells Voldemort, be a man. I've seen the real you. Feel some remorse. I know what's going to happen to you otherwise. What's he saying? If you don't take this opportunity, you are going to die a broken person. Broken, literally, you know, multiple bits of his soul, of his soul in pieces. He's saying, I'm giving you the opportunity to what? Remake yourself. Make yourself whole. He doesn't take it, obviously. Okay? And I guess that's probably why they just skipped that little bit. Maybe it's in the extended DVD release version. I don't know. I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> okay? But that's completely left out. There's something left out at the beginning of the seventh film. The same kind of thing but between Harry and Dudley. It's Dudley's redemption. Dudley takes the bait. And we see, let's use the alchemical language, Dudley transformed. Where do we see it? I don't think you're a waste of space. And Harry then interprets that. When somebody else hears that and says, well, that's not an apology. Harry says, yeah, but coming from Dudley, that's like saying, I love you. Harry hears Dudley say, I don't think you're a waste of space, and interprets it, takes it to mean, I love you, Harry. So what does then Harry say just before Dudley leaves? See ya, Big D. Why is he called Big D? We're told at the beginning of that novel. Excuse me, we're told at the beginning of... Number five. What's Big D? Louder. It's what his friends call him. Or let's put it even tighter. It's what his gang calls him. 
Harry, by calling Dudley Big D, is saying, I'm part of your gang, Dudley. Okay? That's the division between them being resolved. And yet, in the films, it's not there. Okay? Sorcerers did what? It brought my terminology. My terminology. I don't actually intend, but if you are offended, okay. <laughs> it brought the wacko right-wing Christians out of the woodwork. Okay? I'm Christian. I started a church in town. Okay? Father was a minister. So, I mean, don't talk to me about Christianity. I got the scars and everything. But these people were wacko. Those who were wanting to burn her in effigy, burn her books, and say, you deserve to burn in the pit of hell. Why? Because you're leading little Johnny and Susie to witchcraft. Really? Really? I'm a woodworker. I can make a wand for you. Does that mean I, if I gave you a wand, you could go, Wingardium Leviosa, and make Hunter's MacBook there, you know, Levit? No. You could say that until you were blue in the face at 89 years old. And that damn MacBook Pro is never going to move an inch. Why? Well, <laughs> maybe. Is, is your pronunciation of Wingardium Leviosa ever going to make that move? It, does it depend? As Hermione says, you know, kind of get that little flick of the wrist. Chip? No. They're just words. There's nothing in here that makes that happen, right? Similarly, I could give, you know, as Moody says, the false Moody in book four, I could give everybody in here a wand and say, okay, now repeat after me. Avada Kedavra. <laughs> and you can all point him to me, and unlike Moody, I wouldn't even get a blood, bloody nose. They don't mean anything. Every one of the spells in here is either Latin or bad Latin. That's it. It just sounds Latinate. Like Hocus Pocus. Where's Hocus Pocus come from? Anybody know? It's not, it comes from Latin, hoc est corpus. This is my body. The words of institution of the Eucharist, or the communion meal, that the priest says over the piece of bread, this is my body broken for you. And then you hear a little bell ring, and according to the Catholic Church, transubstantiation occurs. And that bread changes into the actual physical flesh of Christ. Hocus pocus. Why? Bread becomes flesh. Abracadabra. Avada cadavra. Abracadabra. Avada cadavra. What's changed? B v, for the most part. Okay? So, the magic in here is not the spells. Where is it? What's the real magic of these books? How many of you have read these more than once? Yeah, come on, nerds. How many have read them more than twice? How many of you read them, you know, kind of like once a year or once every couple of years? Okay, yeah, there's a few of you. Why? Why do you read anything more than once? Get deeper into it. What does that mean? The books are like onions. You just keep peeling the layers away. Okay? These are like that. The Lord of the Rings are like that. I've read the Lord of the Rings, I don't know, 30 years over the last 30 years. 30 times over the last 30 years, probably. Okay? Every time, there's something else I catch new. I mean, I'll be talking in class, and I'm going to go, oh, look at that. And I'm going to make a little note in here or in Lord of the Rings, because there's going to be something I have never seen before. It's just going to jump out at me. Why? Because the authors planned all that? No. Nope. A lot of their subconscious leaks into the books. Okay? But it's something that I'm associating okay, that makes me see that. All right. 12, 20 minutes. We've got 15 minutes. So, skipping with how this begins and such. Yeah, actually... 
When do Harry's parents die? Well, yeah, when he, but when? What date? Anybody know? Halloween. Halloween, October 31st, 1981. Okay? They die October 31st, 1981. Harry is born January, uh, excuse me, um, I got it through the my, months in my mind, July 31st, 1980. So he's a little over a year, not quite a year and a half, okay? His parents are 21. If I remember correctly. So they're pretty young. I mean, they, they have not been out of Hogwarts very long. Um, when McGonagall meets Dumbledore the next day, outside number four Privet Drive, what day is it? Next day is going to be November 1st. Okay. Let me back up for a moment. Bear in mind, Rowling, as I said, is a classics and... French major, okay? She has read widely. She's read medieval literature. She's talked about it in interviews and such. And so her books are infused with a lot of medieval symbolism. Plus, plus she's English. Okay, so what does that mean? It means she's familiar with English customs and English symbols. You can't, and, and this is the, one of the values of my, the Harry Potter course I teach in England is students can't go places without seeing some of the symbols that are here, okay? Because they're just natural. If they go into a cathedral in London or any place else, they're going to see some of the imagery she talks about. For example, phoenixes. They will see phoenixes visually all around them. They will be carved into the walls. They will be painted into images. They will sometimes be woven into tapestries, okay? So English, if they go to church even once a year, even if they don't go to church and they pay attention to just common English festivals, they get this symbolism throughout their lives, all right? So it, it fills in all of this stuff. So the next day is November 1st. Within the Christian calendar, what is that called? All Saints Day, because Halloween is All Hallows Eve. All Saints Day is All Hallows Day. Okay? So there immediately should make your brain go, wait, huh? Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows? So there's something holy, saintly, hallowed be thy name, the Lord's Prayer. Okay? With that word, hallow. Okay? What else? When all the Christians started coming out of the woodwork and wanted to burn her at the stake and everything, how did J.K. Rowling take that? Well, yeah. <laughs> did she respond in like manner? Sometimes she didn't respond very nicely. But she gave an interview in 2000, I think it was, to an interviewer at the Vancouver Sun. And the interviewer said, you know, well, I mean, you have all these people, you know, wanting to <coughs> burn your books and everything. Are you a Christian? And she said, well, yes, I am. I think that in and of itself kind of caught the interviewer off guard. Well, well, what kind? That is, what variety? What stripe? What flavor of the month are you? You know, there's... 22,000 denominations in the Protestant church. Okay. She said, well, Church of Scotland. Presbyterian, in other words. Okay. And she admitted to going more than just, you know, Christmas and Easter. So it, it was real to her. It wasn't, you know, just Christian in name kind of a thing. So the area was like, wow, okay. So, so how does your Christianity inform your writing. That is, how does your Christianity come out in your writing? And here she was very coy. She said, well, if I were to answer that, that would give away the ending. She hadn't yet written book seven, but she had an idea of where all the books were heading. And the interviewer just kind of dropped it. The interviewer didn't go, 
Really? What do you mean by that? What are you saying? Is Harry Jesus? <laughs> Is there going to be a cross that he hangs on and he ah, comes back? Because you know. a lot of people have said Harry is Jesus. Or a type of Jesus. But he's not. Okay. Or that, almost said Gandalf, Dumbledore was Jesus. But he's not. Because <laughs> if he was, he wouldn't be dead at the end, Rudy. He'd come back to life kind of a thing. Alas, there are no spells that can reawaken the dead, Dumbledore says. So she admits to being a Christian. When book seven came out, an interviewer, an atheist Jew who writes for the New York Times, named Lev, and his last name just out of my mind, um, who also writes fantasy literature, did an interview with her, and he began it by saying, um, seems to me you kill God in this book. She's like, what? He said, well, well God seems very absent. And she's kind of like, don't think he's absent as you think he is. And what she means by that, I interpret as, you need to learn how to read, buddy. <laughs> okay, she doesn't mean, well, if you crack my secret code, you'll see God hidden everywhere. It's not what she means. She just means God is present within the book. And not just the word. The word God does show up far more times in book seven than anywhere else. It doesn't show up anywhere in the first, actually it does show up once in the first one. Um, but in like the first three books, it doesn't show up. But then you start to hear, thank God. Like, you know, the meaningless, oh, thank God. But in six and seven, you start to hear it, and it kind of, kind of sounds like it takes on meaning. Well, book seven has an awful lot of religious symbolism. And she's kind of implying, you, you, you need to learn to connect the dots. And, and see what I'm getting. Okay, now let me go back. So, November 1st, All Hallows Day. J.K., excuse me, McGonagall says, when Dumbledore tells her he's left Harry off with his aunt and uncle, she says, you got to be kidding me. This day will probably be known as Harry Potter Day in the future. Okay, it's All Hallows Day. It's All Saints Day. Later on, in the fifth novel, Harry gets a new nickname from Lucius Malfoy. Anybody know what it is? Harry has a hearing at the Department of, uh, at the Ministry of Magic, right? And Harry is acquitted of all charges, and he comes out and he runs into Malfoy and Cornelius Fudge, the Minister for Magic, and Malfoy says, Ah, oh, Patronus Potter. Patronus. What's the root form? Patron. As in, patron, saint. Where's the Patronus come from? Book three. Expecto Patronum. Expecto. I expect, or I seek, or I need even, but what does it literally mean? Ex, out of, pecto, chest. Out of my chest, patronum, a patronus. What's the patronus? For Harry, it's a stag, okay? But what is it? Is it light? It's shield. Keep going with shield. Other words. Guardian, protector, defender, savior. Harry refers to it as his savior. Okay. So, savior Potter, Saint Potter. What happens when George gets his right ear blown off by Snape in book seven? He says to Fred, I'm holy, Fred. Get it? And Fred's like, oh my God, he's lost his mind. He's like, come on, Fred. Get it? Holy. Like St. George? St. George. A martyr. 
Well, George is a partial martyr. He hasn't died for the faith. But what is Rowling doing there? She introduces that idea of martyrdom with George addressing Fred because what are we going to see towards the end of the novel? Yeah, your facial expressions tell me. Fred, okay, is a real martyr. This is how she weaves these ideas back and forth. I'm trying to think out of this. Um... We'll stop there. I won't even try. Okay, so we'll do all of this on Tuesday and maybe get into um, some of Chamber of Secrets. So I'm going to have to...